Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting virtual tour brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office and myself, Chris Stottinger with Pretty Gritty Tours. Tonight, we are looking at one of the forgotten neighborhoods of Tacoma, Northeast Tacoma. And the reason it's forgotten, I think, is because it's on the other side of the Port of Tacoma. It is uh, the finger that extends up and around, and most people assume that it's somewhere else, like Fife or Federal Way. But in fact, uh, Tacoma actually extends quite a ways up along the waterfront on the east side of Commencement Bay. So we're gonna get you into that neighborhood today, let you take a look around at some of the exciting things out there, and then remind you of the history that made that place possible. Uh, this is a live tour tonight, so if you want to ask questions, comment, share knowledge, whatever your heart desires, please do so in the comments below. I'll do my best to respond, and uh, let's, uh, let's get in it. Before we get too deep, in this whole thing though, specifically with this tour tonight, this is a great time to acknowledge the fact that we are on the ancestral lands of the Puyallup tribe and no one better to tell you about that than the Puyallup themselves. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning. This right here is where we are in the world, our homelands. We work on our ancestral lands. We raise our children who go to school on the land of the Poyalip people. We acknowledge that the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed for the whites to take our land for their benefit. Land was assigned to our people. The Caucasians said, this is your land, and they took that land from us too. Our land was stolen from us. Treaties were broken. But we are still here today. Our people forage for food and materials, we pick berries, we canoe, we practice our traditional ways, and we speak Tulshutzi. Just as our ancestors did. We are finished. So, Northeast Tacoma is in itself an enigma and a tricky thing to talk about. And when you're looking at an actual boundary map of it here, it's worth acknowledging right now that some of the most iconic places that people think of for Northeast Tacoma are in fact uh, not part of Tacoma or they are unincorporated Pierce County. For example, Browns Point, a large portion of Caledonia and Dash Point State Park are all iconic parts of the Northeast Tacoma story, but are themselves not part of Northeast Tacoma on a strict boundary sense. But I'm including them in the story tonight because I don't think you can get a full picture of Northeast Tacoma without looking about them. But I would like to acknowledge the fact that they are separate and distinct areas. And I don't want them to be upset feeling like they got lumped in, just like people do with rust into Tacoma. That said, um, there are some other fine points to this whole thing too, but what you gotta know is that this place was established early on and it is the water that makes it iconic. It was the access to so much that really gave people an interest in the area and kept driving them out there. So what do people think of when they think of Northeast Tacoma? The lighthouse, Browns Point, without an apostrophe, I think is the single most iconic part of the waterfront out there and the hills. It is a very 
hilly place. I'm going to see, I know I've got a topographic map for you guys here so that you can see just how nuts it is. It is, in my opinion, the hilliest part of Tacoma. I don't think there is a part of Tacoma with steeper, sheerer, or more plentiful hills. There are some hilly parts of Tacoma, but Northeast Tacoma takes the cake. And years ago, uh, the city of Tacoma was like, Chris, we should do a bike tour. And I was like, absolutely. And they're like, let's do it in Northeast Tacoma. And sure enough, we we led a bike tour through Northeast Tacoma. I managed to carefully craft it so that we started at the highest point and then essentially just coasted our way down to the waterfront. And then I was like, good luck, everyone. Enjoy your trip home. But it, it all worked out. And luckily for us, it concluded here at the Light Keeper's Cabin, which is now a functional museum and rental space. Uh, it is coupled here with the, the boat shop and quite a bit of historic information there. And I wanna actually show you the space because it is the Browns Point Lighthouse that I think people think of the most when you're talking about Northeast Tacoma. So the Light Keeper's Cottage right here, and then it sweeps on down past the boathouse and then right out here, on the part of Browns Point that juts out into Commencement Bay is of course the, the iconic lighthouse. Now this is in the process of being spruced back up. They had a fundraiser recently to put some new paint and features and restore her to her in historic integrity. And it was a very successful fundraiser because people are deeply attached to this lighthouse for good reason. But like I said, this is of course unincorporated Pierce County. But again, we're just we're lumping it all in together, guys. So if you look out across Commencement Bay, you see Ruston across the way, and then of course the city of Tacoma, and then just off to the left down the water is the port of Tacoma itself. And then this is the the historic park down here, which for the longest period of time was the home and yard of the light keepers that looked after that lighthouse. As we ascend up into the sky a little farther, you really get the full picture of Northeast Tacoma, which snakes all the way down to the port of Tacoma and then around into the main city itself. And as we swing left here, you look up on that hill there, that terraced home experience out towards Caledonia and then Dash Point is what you see uh, dashing out on a point right there. These communities all together create the Northeast Tacoma experience and they are pivotal to the area. Let's take you in a little bit more. So uh, this area used to be called Indian Hill and it was the traditional land of the Puyallup tribe. Uh, it was a major source of food and nourishment for the tribe because clams were dug on the beaches here and it was an area where salmon could be harvested as well. And all the way up the hill, they had natural resources that they could forage for food as well. And then as George Vancouver comes down, well, not him, but Lieutenant Puget comes down and surveys the area, they put everything on a chart, start calling Mount Rainier something new, and then this is an area that becomes heavily settled afterwards. It's ironic actually that it's called Browns Point because it was a US Naval survey that came through and called it Browns Point, again, without the apostrophe, and then had a lighthouse erected there because it was one of the most prominent navigational features out there. And then the first light keeper that came out to take care of that particular lighthouse just happened to have the last name Brown. And so people assume because he and his family lived there for decades, that it's Brown's point because of him. But he was actually the second Brown, not the first Brown to come out there. They lived here in this cottage, which again is a museum and uh, a vacation rental space. And I think they are about to reopen. Um, this is run by the Historic Society Points Northeast, which has a ton of incredible information. I'll be sharing their links throughout. We also have the privilege of getting to showcase some of their photos from their historic website as well. But they are the predominant historic source of information for the Northeast Tacoma area. Points Northeast, I'll share more of their stuff. But this is the original Lightkeeper's Cottage out there. You can see 
it hasn't changed too much. It's always been super quaint and adorable. And then out here are two things. So that smaller structure is the generator house that was used to power the foghorn. Uh, I believe it was a diesel generator that provided uh, the power to come through the foghorn and give people navigation during heavy fog. And then the lighthouse, this is the one from 1933. They had an older one that you'll see out there in a second. But that's our that's our brief story of Browns Point there. When you go out to the park itself, you'll see all sorts of interpretive signs. I'll see if I can actually take you guys on a look out here really quick. So again, the cottage down to the boathouse. And the boathouse is really cool. It's probably my favorite part of the park because they showcase a lot of the rowboats that were used at that time, specifically by the family out there. And then you can explore down on the beach out here and get a really good view of everything during low tide. You can see it comes really far up to the rocks up there. But on low tide, you've got free run of this place out there and you can really go out into Puget Sound. When you go up and beyond, you get to see Dash Point, which is the second most iconic part of this whole Northeast Tacoma place. And again, it's not actually part of Northeast Tacoma, but we loop it in. Dash Point is a state park for the state of Washington. Uh, it showed up sort of late in the game due to a recommendation of a resident in the area in the 1960s, but now is a nearly 400 acre state park just, I'm gonna loop up into the left here. And as we pass over Northeast Tacoma, you'll see Dash Point extending out into the distance there. And I'll actually take you down right now. The most prominent feature of Dash Point is of course the Dash Point Dock. Uh, this is not actually part of the state park itself. It's just adjacent to it. The state park is straight down that direction, but it is the docks of Northeast Tacoma that have contributed to the success of this area so much. And the original Dash Point dock, uh, unfortunately, was just run down over years of, of pain and use and has been replaced by the current Dash Point dock that you see today, which is right next to the sort of playground, play center, Metro Parks Tacoma run area out here. Now, if you look past the dock, that's the state park just down there. And then what I love about this area are the terraced homes. When you look up on the hillside, it's got this sort of like Italian Positano feel to it because all the homes are sort of stacked together on this very tightly packed sort of narrowly winding cliffside. And granted, when you look at Positano, it's a little bit different, but it gives the same sort of vibe to me. And every time I tell people that, they're like, are you sure, Chris? I'm like, yeah, I stand by that. I stand by that. If you've never driven down to the Dash Point Park, I'm gonna encourage you guys to do it. Maybe this weekend, get in the car and turn on the AC uh, and go look at it. Because it is these just tiny little roads that snake their way down. And you can see that is how Northeast Tacoma has kind of always been established. So this is from 1943 and really gives an impression of the separation, I think. Port of Tacoma has always been the big divide between the main Tacoma downtown and Northeast Tacoma. And while they are part of the same city, they have really been kept apart by the port for a long time there. And there was a period of time where Northeast Tacoma actually tried to connect themselves better to downtown Tacoma with their own rail line and the army got brought in to shut down that attempt because they needed it to be an official, official organization that created that. And so the best way to get to Northeast Tacoma for years was through boats. So this is the original lighthouse there. It was a kerosene, kerosene lighthouse, originally constructed in 1887 and that needed constant maintenance from a, a lighthouse keeper to come out there and ensure that the lighthouse was full of kerosene and maintained and lit. And you have to scrub the glass all the time because all that kerosene smoke really gets in the way of it. But 
little things started to trickle up after that. Mostly summer camps. For those of you who remember our tour on Salmon Beach, it's kind of a similar experience that we're having in Northeast Tacoma, where this was a summer getaway for a lot of people. They would have these uh, very elaborately themed sort of tent camps out there, and it was just kind of a, a getaway for people to go and escape the excitement and the smoke of downtown Tacoma. As it started to develop infrastructure to cater to those people, i.e. grocery stores, services and whatnot, it became a place that a lot more people were settling to. And a big motivator and instigator in the development of Northeast Tacoma was Captain McDowell here, originally out of Scotland. He left the UK when he was like 15, uh, came to the Tacoma area and then started sort of a steamboat business in the area. And he used to sleep on his boat out by Ruston. And in the middle of the night, a large ship came through and almost cut his small boat in half as it came through in the middle of the night. And he's like, I'm getting out of here. I don't want any part of this crazy downtown Tacoma chaos. So he moved away from the Ruston area and came over to Northeast Tacoma where he set up the D Fleet. The D Fleet was a series of um, Mosquito Fleet steam-powered vessels all starting their names had D's to them. And I think he had six or seven of these particular vessels. And they were the main passenger ferries taking people from downtown Tacoma out to Northeast Tacoma. And I think I have a list of all the names out here. Here we go. So it was the Dauntless built in 1899. Then the Defiance, which I believe is pictured here. That was a 1901. The Daring, the Dart, the Daily, and then... I think those were it. I think those were his main ones. And part of that was building a large dock out into Commencement Bay that was impervious to the wildly fluctuating tides of the area where he could have his entire fleet moored up and protected from storms. So he picked that area that's sort of back away from the lighthouse, which we now call Caledonia because Captain here named it after uh, a place that he had once dreamed of. <laughs> So this is his dock in 1919. You can see it was already in pretty tragic disrepair at that point. So it had to be rebuilt by another dock over time. As more grocery stores, um, this is, I think, Mullenbrook Grocery and Post Office from the early 1900s. As more and more places came out there, this became a heavily residential community, which I think is what a lot of people think of it as today. And in fact, Windermere Real Estate has a very charming sort of uh, look at the Northeast Tacoma area, which really sort of focuses on the residential aspect. And I want to share that with you guys now.
So there you have it. I think that's a really good encapsulation of the Northeast Tacoma area. Also, I want to thank you guys all uh, for your deep concern about my well-being here. Yeah, it is quite hot. I am in an uninsulated craftsman attic when I broadcast these shows. And for the most part, it's not a big deal, except in Tacoma heat wave. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot. So I'm hydrating heavily today, and I would be using the air conditioner, but it interferes with the audio. So wish me luck as we go through Northeast Tacoma today <laughs> during the heat wave of Tacoma. When we are looking at the connection of the area, it's important to talk about bridges. So over the decades, Northeast Tacoma has become a more popular place to live uh, because it has been connected. So this is the Heilbos Bridge, and it's looking out towards Northeast Tacoma at this point. And you can see uh, that it really connects the area. And if you're not aware of where this is, essentially it took the downtown Tacoma, Port of Tacoma area, and allowed you to drive into Northeast Tacoma. And this was constructed for, I think, like, $380,000, which was a pretty big deal at the time, uh, back in 1926. And it was a, a lift span bridge or a draw bridge. Uh, I think lift span is the technical designation for it. And you can see that they still wanted to allow port traffic in and out of there, but it was the major lifeline that allowed people to get into the area. And you can kind of see on the map here, where 509 is now, th that is the main lifeline into Northeast Tacoma. But before that, there was no way to get across the tide flats until the, the bridge came in. And so the quickest route, as you can see, was directly across Commencement Bay on one of those Mosquito Fleet ships. The other dilemma, as you see when it's on a topographic map there, it was very difficult to get the other way in because those hills are so steep trying to get down into northeast tacoma was just as treacherous as trying to come around into it but eventually as people did they really developed the area with i think the most iconic structures there so this was the first school constructed in 1919 and then sort of led to an explosion of schools in the area one of the most iconic is browns point elementary school and that opened in, I think, 1918 with just one teacher and really was quickly sort of overwhelmed by the amount of children that came into it. Today, Browns Point Elementary looks remarkably different. Uh, this is from TCF Architecture, and I want you to take a look inside the building because I think it's a good um, sort of fusion of where Northeast Tacoma is going whereas more and more people find this a really desirable place to live, a sort of more modern architecture is filling in the gaps of what used to just be historic structures out there. Also, we had a good question here. Uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, a lot of the commentary tonight is going on on the Pretty Gritty Tours or City of Tacoma Facebook channels. So don't feel left out. We're still here with you. I'm just responding to uh, the Facebook questions, mostly which are coming through pretty strong tonight. Schools, obviously, like I said, were a big development in the area, including Brownsport Elementary. I think the most famous one is Dash Point School. And again, um, 
we're including it in the, the Northeast Tacoma story, even though it's part of Dashpoint. But this was from 1926, I believe, this picture. And this particular school ends up on the historic register where it's now preserved and taken care of. Um, it operated as a school through the 1970s and then was shut down due to a decline in enrollment. But um, Marine View Presbyterian bought it and then has preserved it as this building right here. And I believe the principal's office is inside this school building today, which operates as a small interpretive museum as well for Dashpoint history out there. Very similar to the way that the, the Light Keeper's Cottage operates as a museum today, which I like that they've maintained these historic structures and use them to tell the story of the area while still allowing you to interact with them, either as a principal's office, which I hope you're not visiting that often, or as a vacation rental, which I hope you are visiting fairly regularly. Uh, this is Annie Brown, who was the, the light keeping family there for a very long time in the early 1900s. I'm gonna say 1919, but I'm not specifically sure on that one. And Mr. Oscar V. Brown, lightkeeper extraordinaire at that dazzling lighthouse. And this is very similar to the glory that they're trying to return the lighthouse to right now. As you saw from the aerial shots, a lot of it has been shuttered. It, the old girl could use a really nice coat of paint at this point. But to get it back to that 1933 glory, uh, it took a little bit of love and work. Now this, particular photos from 1939. And this is what's crazy about Northeast Tacoma and Browns Point is that it kind of hit its peak during the depression. So much development happened out there in the 1930s, including the addition of the lighthouse. And I think a big part of that was the, the public works development coming through in the area and trying to create new infrastructure throughout America. Uh, when the lighthouse came in in 1933, I don't know that they could have possibly predicted that it would become the most iconic feature of the Northeast Tacoma area, but it is. Uh, also, later in 1945 is when they created the, the additional building here for the Foghorn. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the original Foghorn had to be manually powered. They needed like a large bellows to create the flow of air to make that foghorn move. I love this photo. I think you see it around every now and then when you look at Brown's Point. But this is Oscar Brown uh, <laughs> asking for these two young lady to sign the Lighthouse guest book uh, and explaining the significance of it. And this is, let me make sure I get their names right, Shirley Jackson and Anita Rowe. Uh, which were just two young ladies having a fun beach day down there. And they came in uh, to sign to sign the book. And there just happened to be a photographer there for this. Uh, but Mr. Brown, Mr. Mr. Oscar Brown was the light keeper of this facility for 36 years. When he eventually retired, that's around the same time, if I'm not mistaken, that the job of um, maintaining lighthouses throughout the United States switched from the, the lighthouse keepers union and association to become a U.S. Coast Guard position. When we're talking about Northeast Tacoma, though, I think I really want to focus on another prominent figure who is, in my opinion, the most instrumental and powerful figure in the area, and it's Mr. Jerry Meeker. And I've got a picture of him right here. So um, <laughs> this is Jerry Meeker when he was feeding 1,500 Masons uh, in 1930 for their national convention. Uh, and he is doing what he did best, which was his salmon bake. Now, Jerry Meeker rises to massive fame in the area, first with his large clam bakes which then became salmon bakes, which the, the Northeast Tacoma Browns Point area continues to do today. But Jerry Meeker was originally born in the Fern Hill area and then ends up moving up to what is now Northeast Tacoma. 
And there's a little, uh, this is the Meeker Memorial Park. It's the first thing you see when you drive into the Browns Point area from, from the Tacoma area. And it, it does a little bit to talk about sort of his contributions there. But Jerry Meeker ends up taking Meeker as a surname uh, because he worked for Ezra Meeker in the hop fields when he was a boy. And when he anglicized his name, that's the one that he ended up taking. His indigenous name was Lahadal or Lahalda. La and because he was so instrumental to the founding of the Northeast Tacoma area, he actually ends up naming the majority of the streets and the roads in Northeast Tacoma. So if you look at the, the map today, you'll see that it's one of the few parts of Tacoma that actually still has indigenous names on the majority of the streets out there. And that's thanks to Jerry Meeker. What made him so influential and pivotal to the community as a, a diplomat and sort of peace broker was uh, he was a literate member of the Puyallup tribe at a time when that was pretty rare. And he really was a passionate promoter of peace between the people that were colonizing the area and the Puyallup tribe and managed to broker a lot of the connections and traditions that continue in that area today. Uh, Points Northeast has a tremendous amount of information on him as well. Uh, this is a photograph that they have up on their site. But I think the thing that people remember him the most for are the massive uh, salmon and clam bakes, these major community events that brought people out. This uh, particular image here is from Dash Point. And you can sort of see as the area gets really developed, this was in 1939 and it was already pretty prominent. Uh, and you can see some of the crazy houses that are always coming up in there. View homes. View homes are a big thing out in the area, including my favorite home. Uh, if you're ever cruising away from the Browns Point Lighthouse uh, and you're in the Caledonia area, you might have seen this. It's a gated condo complex that sort of has a little bit of a Bavarian theme on the exterior there. If you're curious about what's inside, they have a communal conservatory that's part of the property. Uh, and you can look this up on Zillow. Here's the exterior of it. The interior is all like Southeast Asian inspired. It's got this like warm tropical greenhouse out there. And I think that's quintessential Northeast Tacoma, like secret garden residential area. And you can see a lot of, um, like conservatory, large window, uh, tropical heat room, looking out on Commencement Bay, homes like that in the Dash Point area as well. And the easiest way to get in there was on, on the dock. And today, obviously you can drive out there very easily and it's much easier to get there because it's not only connected from the Tacoma side with 509, but you can actually come down from the Federal Way area into Northeast Tacoma as well. But it is that uh, mysteriousness, I think, of the area that keeps it isolated today. When you're looking uh, down at the area there, you can see a lot of interpretive signs for it as well. But one thing that you won't hear too much about is the importance of this area during the 1940s. And if you're cruising around, you can go to the highest point of Northeast Tacoma today uh, to Watchtower Road. And as the name implies, this used to be the area of one of the major pieces of infrastructure in the area, a, a watchtower. So this particular photo is from 1941, when the 205th Coast Artillery Anti-Aircraft Unit were doing drills and they set up defensive positions throughout Commencement Bay to defend the area from enemy aircraft coming in during World War um, II and they constructed this as well. So this was the aircraft spotter's shack at Browns Point. Um, it's right on the hill between Browns Point and Dash Point, and it's called the Crestview Tower. And you can still see the area where it was on the top of Watchtower Road today. And it had, I'm trying to remember, 
a, a huge amount of community involvement. Everyone in the Browns Point area at some point, I believe, took a turn manning this tower where they would go out and, as the name implies, try and spot enemy aircraft coming in there as this civilian defense unit out there. Uh, this particular photo is from 1942, if I'm not mistaken. And it's looking back towards the Tacoma area, but on the other side, you would get a very sweeping view of Dash Point Park. Um, and Dash Point kind of walks the razored edge between this wide open beach space, specifically at low tide, and sort of a narrow forested area. When you're down on the trails there, you really get um, into sort of the valleys and the streams of the Tacoma area or the Dash Point Northeast Tacoma uh, Bridge District there, I guess. Uh, now Dash Point has sort of a unique history in that it was recommended in the 1960s, I believe, uh, by a community member uh, that it should be part of the Washington State Parks Department. And so it, it had to sort of go through a growing pains there, but today is I think a 461 acre state park that features camping, uh, 3,300 feet of saltwater shoreline. Uh, and the most iconic feature I believe is that you can see the Olympic mountains from there. So if you're down on Dash Point, looking across Commencement Bay on a clear day, you get to take in that Olympic mountain view that was so pivotal to the founding of that area. People just wanted to go down and have a summer getaway. So if you're out exploring Tacoma today, I would like to encourage you guys to dig a little deeper into the Northeast Tacoma history. It is, like I said, one of the forgotten parts of Tacoma, but as I'll give you a, a taste here again really quick, it's certainly one of the most beautiful parts. Uh, the Points Northeast um, Museum down there is reopening very soon, if I'm not mistaken. I think you can request appointment only visitation to the museum right now. And very, very soon, I have to double check their website, they have plans to reopen the Lightkeeper's Cottage as a vacation getaway. And I've been inside, it's really charming. And you can stay there for a weekend, a few days during the week, and just enjoy this pristine, wide open yard looking out on Commencement Bay. And again, come down to the boathouse, look at sort of the maritime history of Northeast Tacoma, and then take in the lighthouse right there on the edge because pretty soon it's going to be refurbished to its original glory and it's it's going to be even more beautiful but i think more frequented by people so if you're looking to get out into a part of commencement bay where not a ton of people are right now this is your opportunity to go see one of the great secrets of tacoma with that ladies and gentlemen if you have any questions i'm going to check the comments here yeah, so was Jerry Meeker any relation to Ezra Meeker? Uh, no, they weren't related, but uh, Jerry Meeker did work for Ezra Meeker in the hops field, and they had a really good relationship with each other. Ezra Meeker had always been a very strong advocate for the rights of the Puyallup, and so when Jerry picked an anglicized name, he chose Meeker as a surname, as sort of an homage to that strong relationship that he and Ezra Meeker had had, at least was the story given to me. Uh, so da, 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 da. I'm just checking right now. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for joining us for another exciting walk through the area. I'm looking forward to a few more really exciting stuff coming up here. We're going to put a roster of our events coming up hopefully early next week. We've got some new and exciting stuff just across the board, but we will be getting into new areas and hopefully getting you guys out and exploring. From here, I'm going to encourage you guys to stay cool because as I can attest right now, it's very hot in the Tacoma area and it's a kind of heat that our infrastructure was not built for. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. 
I'm Chris Stottinger with Pretty Gritty Tours here, brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office, encouraging you to keep on exploring. Have a good night.